This episode is sponsored in part by PTZ Optics. Why need a cameraman when you can just do it yourself? Visit ptzoptics.com for more information. Hey guys, it's Friday, so you know what time it is. It's time for the Retro Buzz, and we've got a great show for you. As always, this guy jumping around. What? You just can't sit. This is like. What is this? We we have Jumping Glenn Planamento. That's going to be his new nickname. Um, I have a feeling we're going to be talking about something to do with your background today, aren't we? Cubert rocks, man. Look at look at this guy. He's he's adorable. How you got, how you got to talk about some Cubert? He's a varsity letterman. He is. By the looks of that jacket, I'm assuming a high jump track star. I'm, I'm, I'm just guessing. If you guessing. took Cubert and made him human, he'd be Doug. That's how cute he is. Well, so it's a good thing we've got Doug with us because we have the voice of reason, the uh, voice yeah. that you're hearing. I, got... I don't even know where to go after that. I don't know if like that was a, a mark on like my large <sighs> nose or like I'm I'm, I'm used to like no like, I was the one some Ken doll quips, but to be compared to Cubert, as cute as he is, man. I was the one with the large nose. We got one. that taken care of. Remember that was that was <laughs> the running yeah, joke, yeah, right? So okay. there we go. I was the one that resembled that the most, but. Uh, Glenn, we have some special guests with us here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna have you introduce our special guests that we have with us here today. Well, we're gonna we're gonna do it first. We're gonna do our game of the week, and that'll actually do it automatically. Oh, so why don't we take why don't we take oh. a look at Glenn's oh, yeah. game of the week? Glenn's game of the week. Is this gonna get me into trouble? A couple See? of copyright strikes. So what video game am I playing this week? It's Cuber. Oh shit! Oh shit! Oh shit! Bye bye. Cuber was an arcade game developed and published for the North American market by Gottlieb in 1982. It's a 2D action game with puzzle elements that uses an isometric graphics to create a fake 3D effect. The object of each level of the game is to try and change every cube in the pyramid to the target color. Sometimes that's hitting the cube once. But it may also, as higher levels go on, take multiple times to get the right color. The player does use a joystick, but unlike most arcade games, not an eight-way or a standard four-way, it's diagonals only. Which is kind of why it's also been hard to port the game to the home because of that. The designers were Warren Davis and Jeff Lee. I honestly can't name all the platforms that Cubit was released for, because it had a ton. But some of the more common machines you can find Cubit on, of course, was the arcade, the Atari 2600, Atari 5200, Atari 8-bit line, and ColecoVision, which probably had the best port of the early consoles. Commodore 64, Game Boy Color, MSX, VIC-20, and Television, NES, the Bang the Box Odyssey 2, mobile platforms, SG-1000 from Sega, they had a standalone tabletop version, the TI-994A, ZX Spectrum, Game Boy, PlayStation 3, PlayStation 4, PlayStation Vita, Dreamcast, and so many more. Cubit was very well received in the arcades among the critics. The game was Gottlieb's most successful game and among the most recognized brands from the golden age of arcade games. As I said before, it was ported to multiple platforms and it did so well, there were some sequels made for Cuba, but never quite reached the same level of success as the original Cubert. One of Cubert's most notable characteristics is his swearing. His incoherent phrase is made of synthesized speech generated generated by the sound chip. So when you play the game, you're the player of Cubert, who starts out each game at the top of the pyramid made of 28 cubes, and moves by hopping diagonally from cube to cube. The landing on the cube causes it to change color, and changing the color every time to get to the target color allows the player to go to the next level. Now, again, Cubert, like Pac-Man, is fairly well known who the bad guys are as well. You have Coily, who's a purple egg that comes down and turns into a snake. You have Ugg and Wrongway, two purple creatures that hop along the sides of the cubes and try to smack Cubert. Then you have uh, Slick and Sam, two green creatures that descend down the pyramid and change the colors that you put the right way to the wrong way. So you have to do them all over again. 
Cuba from 1982 is one of the most recognized video game characters, right up there with Pac-Man, Mario, and Donkey Kong. In fact, from a standpoint of products, Cuba was up there with the best of them. You saw Cuba as plush toys, Legos, you saw him in, in movies like Wreck-It Ralph. What's he saying, Felix? Stand by, man. Smooth. That was very smooth. Um, he was pretty much everywhere. He even had a TV show on the Saturday Super Cake. Right there was Donkey Kong, Frogger. Pac-Man had his own show on a different network, but Cuba did have his own show, and it was it was a fun, fun character. Probably the again the biggest draw to Cuba was swearing. Which, of course, you didn't know what he said, but you got the gist when you saw those characters appear above his head and got conked on the head. But Cubert, again, is a game I can recommend, and I'm sure you've already played Cubert, um, but if you haven't, how could you not have? Get some Cubert on. It's available in MAME, and of course, you can still find it in many, many consoles. Again, from the Atari 2600 all the way up to the Xbox. So that's what I've been playing this week, although I think the guests today might have a little more information on Cubert than I do. So let's get back to them, but remember, no matter what you do this week, remember to game on. So as if we had no idea what the show was going to be about, it is about Cubert. You simpletons, it's Cubert. And of course, we have, <laughs> simpletons. We have New Wave Toys here, and we have its CEO, Shiloh, here, who brought a special guest, but I'll let him introduce the special guest. Well, thank you, Glenn, and I'm very pleased to present to everybody the creator of Qbert, Mr. Warren Davis. Nice. Hello. Hello, everybody. How are you out there in virtual land? <laughs> Excellent. I see that Qbert right behind you, and I know we're all fans. I'm going to shut up because I'm in my giddy mode right now because, you know, you're, you're on the show. So I'm going to do this, and Doug, you talk. Oh, I was, I was just going to say it's a pleasure to have Warren on, um, arcade legend not only for Qbert but for your other mini arcade titles that other people maybe are familiar with and maybe don't associate you with uh what does he got teeny or terminator 2 you got revolution x you got cruising usa you got joust Qbert. uh i'm well, sure i'm missing a couple but i mean well, you've I, got let, quite the me, quite the catalog let me set the record straight though uh I contributed in some small ways to some of those games. I was on the team for T Terminator 2 and Revolution X, uh, as well as Qbert. Uh, uh, and uh, for the other games like Cruising USA, uh, I'm associated with uh, some like NARC and Mortal Kombat, but I didn't really contribute to those games other than creating the digitizing system that allowed them to get the digitized graphics that they use. That's, that was my contribution to those other games. You say that like it's such an yeah. insignificant yeah. part. Though. <laughs> it's such a major no, detail to those games. It's no, I, I don't. I, yeah. Yes, it was. It was a. It was a contribution. But uh, what it, what the other guys, what the you know these guys, these amazing designers and programmers did with that tool, is their own accomplishment. You know. Mm -hmm. So you know, and you know, I can't really take credit for Mortal Kombat or NBA Jam. That was you know. Uh, Ed Boone I'll and John credit, Tobias, credit. that was Mark Tamell and a bunch of other guys. So, you know, it, that wasn't really, uh, you know, I can't take credit for, for the, the games themselves. Okay, I will take the credit then. Pass it over <laughs> to me. And, and I would also like to point out right up front that Qbert was, you know, there was a, there was a Qbert triumvirate in, who made Qbert, and it was myself, uh, who was the designer and programmer. Jeff Lee was the graphic artist, and Dave Thiel did the sounds. And uh, both of those guys, you know, I mean, the game wouldn't be what it is without their contributions. It was really a, a, a team effort. Now, with the, with the sounds that were played on Qbert, was it actually just a sound chip being used for all those samples? Or did you actually have a speech chip that you kind of made it say the words? There, there was a, there, we had a soundboard that, that we used for our pinball machines, but there was also a speech chip. And uh, Dave Thiel, uh, as our sound designer, uh, absolutely hated the... <laughs> <laughs> the results of that speech chip uh, because it sounded terrible. This was 1982, you know, and it, it just wasn't technically uh, up to snuff. But uh, he was so frustrated with trying to get it to say things that he decided for Qbert, he thought, I'm just going to throw random numbers at it and have it speak gibberish. And when he did that, 
the sound was phenomenal. I mean, that's what really gave Kubert uh, his voice. Just it's literally random phonemes. And that's what people need to understand today is back then. I mean, there's a couple of games like Berserk and Space Fury that had sound, but it wasn't the most common, you know, thing. And to hear something talking, but something that was like Kubert ease, it was hysterical. I remember people just standing on the machines laughing their heads off when they heard it make it, you know, clunk. And say, burp, burp, burp. Yeah, no, it was great. It was great. It was genius on his part, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially with the the closed captioning, so to speak, with the speech bubbles and the <laughs> you know the translation of that gibberish. Yeah, yeah, and you know people are constantly thinking they hear him saying something, but uh, it's literally just just random. Mm -hmm. Except for one, he does say. If anyone knows in the chat, he does say two words, two English words. If you know what it is, put it down in the comments. <laughs> and when he says them. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Make it a two-parter. It's actually three words, Glenn. I don't want to. Is it? Well, I don't know. Please, please correct him. Please correct him. Because... If we're talking about the same thing. <laughs> he actually says five words. If you will. Oh, does he? counting words. Yeah. Everybody's really... getting an education tonight. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the phrase, though, Glenn was looking at is three words, and then there's another one of two words. I'm a man of two words. That's why I was saying the two words. <laughs> well, whenever you want me to reveal it, let me know. Well, wait for this. So far, oh, I got Brad just put in the chat that what I was thinking about, it was two words. It was bye-bye when the game had ended. So yeah. what were the, if I will leave, we'll let people talk in the chat, see if they find out what the other ones are, and we'll maybe go at the end and, and give them out. But let's talk about something else real quick here, if we can. Cuba was a great game in the arcade, but we're here for a reason of maybe we can own this at home. Can we? You sure can, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, and um, this is um, our new release game. Our next game that's coming out is Qbert. We have two variants, and we actually have a pre-order on right now at our website at www.dowavetoys.com. You know what uh, I noticed, though, Jilo, real yeah. quick? I didn't notice one thing, but you have the two special editions here. Yep. There should have been a third. You needed a third with a Glenn's plastic bag edition. They put the plastic bag over the box to keep it safe from dust. Just well, for I mean, future. You, Glenn, you, okay. know, you know how well New Wave Toys packages their products. I mean, you're going to get do. a box within a box, within a box, with plastic yeah, actually, wrap around it. So, yeah. I mean, you're already covered. Actually, you know, Shiloh was, Shiloh was very shocked when he saw what I had. He said, it's still in the box, Glenn. I was like, yeah, I got the packing box. Yeah. I got the inside box. I got the foam from the box. Of course I still have that. <laughs> well, we use the highest quality cardboard on our boxes, you know, so... I really don't blame. There you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how so, did Shadow, how did how did you two meet? I know that the project obviously started. Did you guys know each other beforehand and this worked, or you kind of started this project and then you met? Yeah, actually, we've been working on the project for quite a bit of time. Um, like most of our games, we're we're not the fastest. We're uh, um, you know we about have about an eighteen month window that it takes for us to get things right. And um, in this particular case, there's a feature on um, Qbert, the, the, the solenoid, the, the coil, the kicker, that was a challenge. And so um, we always wanted to reach out to Warren, but we, we, we waited till the beginning of this year to reach out, to get him involved, um, get feedback, test the game, and see what he thinks um make sure it's correct and also um, be the ambassador for our project um, through the pre-sale period through the launch later on this fall so no we did not know each other but um really great to meet like such a legend and have him involved in the project couldn't ask for more and i'll, I'll add to that as well um you know they really the person that should uh be credited with this special warren davis edition is uh tony temple the arcade blogger uh, i don't know if you people are familiar but if you uh, sometime uh, ago he posted a blog about my personal cubert cabinet that i've had here in my home for the last 38 years uh it was an engineering sample uh it's sort of a frankenstein of parts uh, and, you know, when the game was released, they said, would you like to have a Qbert? And I said, yeah, sure. So they offered me this production or this uh, engineering sample. 
and I think I paid them like a hundred bucks for it or something like that. And I've owned it ever since. And I almost immediately put in the ROMs for faster, harder, more challenging Qbert because that has always been my favorite Qbert uh, and the Qbert that I go to when I want to play. Uh, the one that, and if people aren't familiar with the story of faster, harder, more challenging Qbert, it was it was made right after Qbert when I started hearing stories that people were playing for hours on a single quarter. So that made me worried. And I thought, oh God, I tuned it too easy. So uh, I, um, I uh, basically, you know, Jeff and I, you know, went to work on seeing what we could do to, to rejigger it and make it a little more challenging. And uh, that was never released by Gottlieb. So I just hung on to the only copy that existed. Uh, and it was in this cabinet. Uh, for 15 years until 1997 or so. Uh, I was working for Disney Interactive at the time and somebody I worked with had connections to the main project, which at that time was fairly recent. They'd come out with a, an emulator for Gottlieb's hardware and you could play Qbert on a PC using the main emulator. So uh, I said, well, you know, I've got these ROMs and it doesn't require any hardware change. If you can emulate Qbert, you can emulate this. And uh, I handed the, the ROM images over to him and he handed them over to the MAME guys and uh, they, through whatever means they did, they released it out to the world. And so the world has had access to this uh, faster, harder, more challenging Qbert since about 1997. Uh, that's Unfortunately, awesome. I don't believe in uh, hardware gaming piracy, so I, I don't have any of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i and, definitely applaud you for you know getting that rom out there to the masses because something like that had you not shared it with the masses you know would have fallen by the wayside and only got to be experienced by a select few so uh, the community you know definitely appreciates that contribution for sure yeah I, and i'm i'm grateful for those people who have you know burned it into their uh their cubic cabinets i've seen of course at ga retro gaming shows many Qbert cabinets that have been retrofitted to be able to select between the different versions of Qbert, uh, it, it sometimes even including Qbert's cubes, which I had nothing to do with. But, uh, you know, it, if you have an upright Qbert cabinet, it sure would be nice to be able to select uh, any of the original Qbert games, which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other part of the story is that when uh, Shiloh came to me uh, and said, we're thinking of, you know, making your personal cabinet uh, which just blew me away <laughs> because like, why? Right. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> so humble. So, so humble. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm like, okay, I, I hope people will want to have it, but, you know, I've been looking at it every day for, you know, 38 years, but uh, uh, I told them it really wouldn't be my cabinet unless it did have faster, harder, more challenging Qbert. And, and that's when they really started thinking about putting that in and they did. So now you can, you can yep. switch between regular Qbert and faster, harder, more challenging Qbert. So, Warren, real quick, before we go any further, because I, I want people to pay attention to what you're saying. We have to give away a license tonight of RetroSoft Studios Retromania. And so I want you to throw in some of this stuff that you can ask a question about to see who's paying attention to your to your information about Qbert at the end of the show and throw it out there on, on Qbert. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, sure. I'll, if I can remember what I've said by the end of the show. <laughs> no, no, no. They have to remember. They have to remember what you're saying. Right. Yeah. But so do I. If I, 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 I right. cool. Well, see, the pro is you could just make it up, and you know, you can, you can cover your base real quick. You know, you, uh, yeah. Uh, I'll throw this out right now. Uh, that. I, this is maybe some people know this, maybe some people don't, but the tuning of the original Qbert does not change after level five. Even though you go to five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then it seem it seemingly stays on level nine forever, the, the tuning tables after level five uh, are all identical. It, it just literally doesn't change after level five. There's a little bit of trivia. There you go. Yeah. Seeing as how I probably never got to level five, I never would have known. <laughs> <you know. laughs> I, I will. I also want to say one more thing is that if people do give faster, harder, more challenging Qbert a try uh, on the new wave toys replica, um, you can go into settings 
and make it easy. There are operator settings that are accessible and you can go and set it easier and you can get and you can also set your extra lives to come quicker. So don't be discouraged by trying faster, harder, more challenging Kubernetes too hard. You do have the means to make it easier. Speaking That's my well, settings. Shiloh, note you. real quick. I'm sorry, Doug, go ahead. Go. I was just going to ask Shiloh, I'm like, could you speak to some of the features of both machines of the Qbert and the Warren version? That's what I was going to ask. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think it, 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 it was a little bit of a, a, a uncovering, finding um, uh, Warren's prototype in Tony's um, uh, blog. And um, we just thought, this is so cool. It has the different artwork on the sides, which we should talk about, because I'd like to know what the thought pattern was behind that artwork. We've never really talked about that. Uh, it has the swear word marquee. The art is all slightly different in, in the control panel. And um, we're like, you know what? This just makes a really great variant. So let's do a really super limited amount and um, offer them out to our, to our customers who are, you know, appreciate this type of stuff. And, um, you know, both games feature, uh, both versions, I should say, feature both games, like Warren mentioned, but also all the dip switch settings, all the menu sweat, uh, settings, the test modes, all that stuff, they're, it's all packed inside. These are the types of things we've been trying to, to build into, the, into our cabinets as, as we've um, progressed through the years. And we just wanna have as, as close to a pure, you know, um, arcade ownership experience as you could without actually having the real machine. So that's why working closely with guys like Warren really uh, helps us ensure we're doing a good job and keeps us humble. Um, but uh, we, uh, I, I also want to mention just right down to the, um, the textures on the side panels, they're going to be different on both versions because the artwork on Warren's prototype is actually painted on where on the regular production version, it's it's vinyl decals like we have on most of our um, cabinets. So uh, another difference is uh, a coin door, an early version of the coin door with the Warren Davis edition as a Gottly raised letter coin door. And uh, they later changed that and it was a, so not a raised letter coin door for the uh, production versions. So um, we try to replicate as much as we can, um, including all the decals that uh, Warren has added to the cabinet over the years. Um, this is gonna be our first cabinet with a lot of hand distressing because we're trying to get the right wear and tear. And we're really going deep and in, in trying to, um, you know, capture every detail we can of the way uh, Warren's cabinet kind of sits in his house today. That's excellent. Excellent. Now is the, both units gonna have what you have in some other units. We have HDMI out and maybe external controller options for people who wanna play that way, or is it? Yeah, those are standard features now um, that we'll have on most games. That makes awesome. sense. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, yeah, a lot of people like the HDMI out with the controller support allows you to kind of kick back and play on the big screen. Um, I guess the, the biggest, uh, I already mentioned it once, but it's the knocker coil and um, I always wondered why does Qbert have a pinball knocker inside it, right? So I asked Warren, it was one of the first questions I asked him, and I was really surprised with, with the answer. And Warren, if you would, why don't you share this story with us behind the, the, the pinball knocker coil? Sure, sure. Uh, so while when we were making Qbert, uh, we had Qbert, you know, jumping off of the pyramid and falling, plummeting to his death. And one of our uh, engineering techs, uh, a guy named Rick Ty, said, you know, it'd be cool if you put one of the pinball knockers in the cabinet. And so, like, when he hit the ground, you'd actually hear a sound. <laughs> so I thought, yeah, that acts, that's a cool idea. So we put it in. Uh, it was a dip switch controllable. So if an operator didn't like it, they could turn it off. Um, but, uh, yeah, we put it in. And uh, I liked it, except... The sound that I was looking for was the sound of like a body hitting the ground. And the sound that it was making, you know, it was making a yeah. like a hard knock, like you're knocking on a door. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, is there anything we can do to soften the sound? So we tried a number of things. And one of them was we 
put a little piece of uh, foam, like a little piece of the foam that came at the end of tubes of uh, integrated circuit chips. It was a very small, tiny little thing. And if we put it on the cabinet right where the knocker was going to hit it, it softened the sound just enough to make it sound like a thud rather than a knock. So I was very excited. I thought this is a great feature. And we went to management and we said, can you do this? And they said, well, you know, we can put the knocker in, but to actually have somebody go into every cabinet and position this little piece of foam just so and to have it stay on. And they thought that was going to be uh, overly labor intensive. And, during the <laughs> process. and so they said, yeah, we'll do the knocker, but we won't do the uh, we won't do the uh, uh, foam. And so. As cool, you know, people love this feature, and as cool as a feature it is, I am aware of, you know, how much better it could have been. And uh, I, I actually have put a piece of foam in my personal cabinet here in my house. <laughs> so it does soften the sound just a teeny bit, and, and I'm much more happy with it. But uh, I will also say that having seen the prototype, their knocker sound, I think, is, is a little softer than the, the actual knocker. What, for whatever reason, I don't know. I, I'm sure it's not because they put a little piece of foam in, but uh, whatever <laughs> technology they're using to get that knock, uh, yeah, it sounds uh, well, sounds close enough to the production cabinet, but also a little softer. So it sounds. You have to remember different. their machine is smaller. So there's a little little piece of foam. That's why. You know. <laughs> it would yeah. be a very little piece of foam. Yeah. <laughs> it is just really great that that worked out. You know that. We, we were so happy when we heard back from Warren. He's like, you know what? The knocker sounds like really good. You know, we're like, all right. Cool. <laughs> you know? So, because it was, it was a pain in the ass getting it to work, but uh, it's well worth it. It had to have it. I mean, we're not going to release a Qbert without it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's funny because a lot of the arcade versions, actually the, the, um, the coil stopped working, I think, or they just turned it off, you know? So some people might not even know that it was, it was there, but I just thought it was so interesting that, it was meant to mimic the sound of little old Qbert hitting the bottom of the cabinet. <laughs> oh, that's so awesome. <laughs> Real quick, uh, we have a couple of super chats uh, mm -hmm. in here. Uh, Zohar has always been around. We got a super chat from Zohar saying, Charlotte, I'm a huge fan of your products. Are you? Are there any plans to release a Mortal Kombat next year? We should have known that was coming. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'll shut up now. <laughs> Um, do we have it? Do we have any Mortal Kombat potentially in the future? Anything's possible. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that much. We we had it. We learned a lot by making Street Fighter Two about fighting games, and we dialed in our controllers and everything. So hey, you never know. Stay tuned. We have another one from RetroSoft Studios. Keep up mm -hmm. the great content, guys. It's only because we have you two on. So we appreciate uh, you guys coming on today. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> What else do we have here? Some more super chats. Zohar again. Charlo, are you and Ed Boone friends? <laughs> uh, yes, we know each other. Um, I've worked on a couple of projects with Ed. Um, Lego um, Dimensions being the most recent. So, yes, no Ed Boone. Okay, I think we have just also one more add, again from... I'll just add one more thing. Uh, sure. We also, um, in a, my previous job, uh, worked on a really great uh, Mortal Kombat fight stick that was the collector's edition version uh, for Mortal Kombat 8, maybe, I think. I'm not mm -hmm. actually... The Xbox controller? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. I have it. Yep. Xbox That's controller good. that opened. Yeah, they made that. So Fantastic fight stick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Ed, Ed's very, very... Um, he's on the same page as us. He wants everything accurate right type of joystick you know all that kind of stuff so it's yeah. important the, you know awesome. uh, that's why you, i appreciate it about you guys because when you when you make something it is those little details um the controller as everyone knows me the controller is your interface to the game and if you put in a larger controller or a wrong controller or, or trying to make one controller do another task it wasn't meant to it takes away from the game um like minor yeah. controllers I, a lot of people with their xbox and playstation controllers you don't look at the controller you know they just they're just doing it like you know like this yeah. that's how the controllers have to be so the attention you guys put to your controllers because they are small but the thing is they're small but they're extremely usable they're robust and they, they just feel right so i take my hat off to you guys for the work you do in those thanks that's why we're so slow <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
And, and Qbert's a fine example of one of those where you have to get the control schematics, you know, correctly done. I, I've seen Qbert thrown in a bunch of, you know, MAME style multicades with a standard up, down, left, right joystick. And obviously it doesn't translate at all. So it's great that you guys are able to replicate it authentically and not only do it the right way, but do it the right way on a, such a small scale. To, to be honest, the changing the direction of, of the, uh, for the Qbert joystick, it was pretty, I mean, all we had to do was shit, rotate shit. it a quarter, <laughs> yeah, 45 yeah. degrees. Yeah. yeah. So that was Shuttle. actually quite easy. Shuttle, I got to tell you, buddy, this is a, yeah. this is something I learned from Star Trek and it was Scotty. You always make it sound difficult, even if it's easy. <sighs> it's going to take yeah, me 30 tough. minutes. You always say it was the most difficult thing, but you dialed it in perfectly. Just for next time, Shallow. Thanks, Glenn. Here to help. <laughs> so now, speaking of turnaround, said, I'm sorry. I'll start I was say, speaking quick, of turnaround quick. time, um, obviously, you know, pandemic still kind of a thing. What's been the major headaches for you guys just trying to develop and create things? Because you've got other things in the queue. Obviously, you know, timetables go completely out the window when you're talking about a pandemic world. Yeah, boy, it's been a it's been a tough year for anybody involved with business overseas and and the, just the, the rising costs and the reality we're dealing with now, it's uh, it's crazy. I mean, uh, raw materials are through the roof, labor costs are through the roof, um, uh, components, MCUs, super long lead time, paying two three hundred percent markups on those. Um, and um, we're in a situation right now where we have products that are finished, but we can't get containers to get them over here. And this is a real, I mean, we're not a big company, obviously, we're a small company, but um, it's a real problem because, uh, you know, our factories are now just full. I mean, we have USB machines, we, 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 uh, we have that have been sitting for a month that we can't get a container for. And it's not like we're not trying, we're trying everything we can. We just keep getting bumped off these off the vessel. Um, we just finished 1942, our factory has no room to start 1943. <laughs> you know, that's just that they're jam packed and it's not just our stuff. I mean, it's some mm -hmm. of the other vendors they work with too. So it's, it's a real challenge and it's very frustrating that, you know, things that were automatic before really i mean booking containers and getting things over you could book it a week in advance it was here three weeks later it, you know it wasn't was unless you got caught in customs of course you know which has mm -hmm. happened to us too <laughs> i mean everything's happened to us uh but that can happen but uh yeah it, it's a challenge right now and um i hope everybody understands that's why we had to raise our prices and uh, it's it's we try to keep the prices as low as we can. Um, just want to make it the barrier of entry, you, you know, and and provide as much value as we can. But we had absolutely no choice but to to raise the prices, or we would go out of business. You know, we would well, make the, the two things, as far as raising <laughs> prices. I think that's pretty much across the board. So it's not like something that you're just doing. You know, it's happening across the board. But I'm actually. Um, not surprised about the shipping issues, but I'm actually not, I'm actually glad that Tesla and the car companies have been stealing all your CPUs for your console. Cause I know they've been, you know, jacking up people's CPUs. And I know you probably use the same chips that the AI and the Tesla yeah, use, right? They have. Yeah, well, a lot of the, 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 the MCUs you're talking about are, are basically uh, for driving screens, right? LCD screens right. are obviously in every single freaking thing these days, right? So, um, we just did the beginning of the year. I mean, we just did our best to procure as much as we could. And, you know, so we could keep building cabs, but now it's like, okay, well, we got, we got over that hurdle, but now we can't get anything over here. It's you can't impressive. get them over here to sell and produce yeah. and you know, deliver. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm hoping things change next year. It certainly nothing's changing this year, mm -hmm. but you know, we are going to get these over. I mean, we're working every night trying, we're working with several different forwarders, you know, trying to, trying to get this done. And every time we're like, yeah, you're, you're okay. We have a spot for you. They don't send the shipping order that, you know, and then they're like, no, actually there's no spot for you. 
So it's, it's tough. It's tough right now. And I think everybody's probably feeling it, especially smaller companies like us. That's maybe you could, maybe you could rent a spot in, in one of those European cars, just stash it on the front seat and the back seat, and just have them bring it over that way. Are you suggesting they smuggle, Glenn? That sounds. I don't good. want to use that. Smuggle is an awfully harsh <laughs> word, Doug. I was going to say, you know, you know. And hey, when you're driving cars, they have a passenger lane, don't they? You have a passenger, you go in the special lane. You know, maybe they can help you that way. <laughs> Carpool smuggling. Okay, when you put you carpool in, <laughs> besides smuggling, it, it makes it less offensive. I got it. I got it. I got it. Yeah, I don't want to switch gears. I don't want to switch gears too too much. But when Cuban obviously is was a hit, you know, um, how did the concept come about? You know, who really started with that concept, and then did it change at all from the original concept versus what you actually designed at the end? Was it a totally different game than you came out with? Uh, well, I I tell people it it was a it was an evolutionary process. There there was no design at the beginning. Uh, basically, because it was my first game uh, that I was totally responsible for. Uh, I I had been working at Gottlieb since January of 1982. I assisted another programmer and doing some little tasks for him on another game that he was that was his game. And then when that game was done and I was free, they basically said, all right, you know what you're doing now, you know as much as you need to know, make a game. <laughs> and the way Gottlieb ran at the time is you didn't have to pitch an idea. Uh, they just, you know, you just worked. You just worked on your own, whatever you wanted to work on. It was a really free and amazing way to launch. I've got to give credit to the guys who ran the department, which was Howie Rubin and uh, Ron Waxman. So, uh, you know, I knew I, I learned a little bit of the ropes, but I felt I had a little bit more to learn. And uh, one of the things I hadn't done on my first little project was working with anything random or working with gravity. So I so I, I just was looking for a programming exercise that would use those two things. And uh, it just so happened that uh, Jeff Lee had created uh, this sort of like Escher pattern that looks like cubes. Right. But it, it filled the screen. And uh and uh, Khan Yabamoto is another programmer, best known for Mad Planets. He was using that for some weird experiment where he was flipping the background in the foreground or whatever. But I saw that on the screen and I just saw this screen filled with cubes. And I thought to myself, well, you know, it's interesting to me if, if, you, if you carved that into a pyramid, right? So there's one cube at the top, then two cubes, then three cubes. And let's say a ball were to fall on the top cube it would have one of two places to go when it landed, right? It would bounce to the left or bounce to the right and down. And, and every time it hit a cube, it would either go left or right. Well, that's binary. That's a programmer's dream, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, if there are, you know, we, I, it looked like we could fit seven, you know, levels of cubes, rows, uh, and so there'd be seven bits, seven random bits would determine the path of a ball. So this was just an exercise. So I, I basically programmed random balls falling down a pyramid of cubes, uh, just literally just for an exercise. But when people saw it, they were like, wow, that, that looks so cool. You got to do something with that. So then it was like, well, OK, what would I do next? I guess I'd put a player character on there and have him jump around. So that was a challenge. You know, it, this is not a 3D environment. So trying to get the physics to look right, that was a challenge. So I did that. And then it was like, all right, I got a player jumping around. What do I want to do next? And literally the entire game was developed that way. I just did something. And then I was like, well, what do I want to do next? <laughs> Until the game just was done. Pull, well, pulling they, ideas they, out of thin air. Yeah, yeah but how did, they, how did yeah, the characters I mean, I mean, develop? Pardon? How did you how did you develop the character? So you put a, you put a character on the screen for the player. Was it Cubert at that point? Or that was still something that wasn't even... A concept yeah it was just a player like a person you know, it, it was cubert uh he didn't have that name so what happened well you know jeff lee was the the artist of the group i mean we we i don't there were a couple of programmers who did their own art but i think for us programmers who didn't do their own art jeff lee was pretty much the only guy and he was always working on more than one game at a time so uh when i needed a player character i went to jeff and i said do, do you have any characters 
lying around things you might have designed <laughs> that you just don't have a use for yeah, and he did it. he did he put them all up on the screen and there were like <laughs> five or six of them and they were all you know awesome looking awesome yeah and, and the one that i thought would make a good player character was the big orange ball like thing with the big <laughs> long nose which he designed that way because he envisioned a game where this character would shoot out of his its nose uh, <laughs> but i wasn't interested in doing that and i honestly yeah. didn't see how i could possibly make that work on a pyramid of cubes the physics you know the illusion of, of three-dimensional physics was already challenging enough i was like i don't want to deal with shooting something so uh i did not use that but i but he graciously let me use the character and then at that point we you know uh we were partners you know er, you know he was we were constantly bouncing ideas off each other a lot of his ideas went into the game uh i was just the filter since nobody else was programming it if somebody had an idea and i thought it was a good idea i'd put it in if somebody else had an idea and i didn't know how to do it or if i didn't think it was a good idea it didn't go in that was pretty much how the game got developed so Warren, question for you. Uh, it's very interesting to me in particular that the, the um, first of all, why don't you tell everybody what the, the first real uh, working title was for, for the game? Well, okay, I'm not, if you want. I'm not entirely sure. You might be alluding to one of two things. Uh, as the well, game well, was, it's not some boogers, the, what I'm allu alluding to. As the game was being developed, I didn't give anything a name because it was just a programming exercise and I didn't, wasn't ever sure it was going to be a game. Yeah, but uh, yeah. I, I called it the Cubes game. That's literally as imaginative as I got. Now, the story is out there that the game was originally called Snots and Boogers. And that <laughs> is patently not true. It was never officially called that. As far as, you know, from my, per and you could talk to Jeff Lee and he might tell you another story, but from my perspective, it was just a joke. It was a funny joke because, you know, if he did shoot out of his nose, that would be kind of cool. But I didn't do that. I never considered it. And I never thought Snots and Boogers was anything other than a joke. And I think, you know, I think somewhere along the line, somebody was saying something about this and somebody who heard the story it misinterpreted this as being oh the game was the game used to be called that but it never was it was just a joke that's awesome and and can you also explain when the game first went out for test and also on the prototype there is what we call the swear word marquee um was this because it actually game was was not named at the time yeah uh, there was a point in the development where we were like, you know, the game needs a name. <laughs> you know, I avoided giving it a name for a very long time. Uh, and so I went around the office and I took a poll. I, I literally asked everybody, everybody, what, would, what do you think the name should be or do you have any ideas? And I had a list, a legal pad filled with names that all just were, you know, terrible. They, I just didn't like any of them. So the next thing we had to do was we had to have a meeting about it. But before that, uh, Howie Rubin, our is v, v, uh, VP of business development and a very much out of the box kind of thinker, uh, he was like, well, why don't we just name it the, the swear balloon? And I was like, uh, and I wasn't alone. Of course, everybody was like, well, OK, how, what are you going to call it, though? How are you, if people want to talk about it, what are they going to call it? And how he would say, you know what, if this game is as good as I think it's going to be, they'll find a way. Uh, and, and he, you know, at his insistence, uh, test cabinets went out with the swearing marquee of a small number. Uh, but uh, I, I do think at that point we had named the character. And that was a result of a, a, a very long meeting with about, oh, I don't know, 10 people in a room just talking very seriously about what this character should be called. It's a, it was a very surreal, uh, absurd <laughs> imagine, yeah. kind of experience to, to listen to this conversation. But, but it did result in the name Qbert, and everybody just felt it was right. I mean, it was an electric feeling at the end of that meeting because, because everybody really did. just It just felt absolutely right. 
Agreed. To be a fly in the wall. To be a fly yeah. in the wall back then. Oh, my God. Oh, absolutely. Oh, my God, yeah. I can only imagine, you know, that conference room, people bouncing around the ideas and, like, the the history of this character and what is, you know, psychological profile is and why you should be named this or why you should be named that like i can imagine that being a very odd surreal experience for sure oh my god yeah i i had an out-of-body experience at some point <laughs> where i just didn't believe what was going on and especially as it wore on because my memory is that it was a fairly long meeting and by the end it's like i think we all just were dying to get out of there Let's just... <laughs> well, warren another question so kubert was the winner what was the worst name that you thought that someone said you're like what no I mean, I uh, honestly, I can't remember most of them, but the only one that stuck in my mind that that w was a suggestion from one of our managers called, and uh, he suggested Arnie Aardvark. Oh, because of the long <laughs> nose. Arnie yeah. the Aardvark, yeah. Yeah, I, just, I don't know uh, if that's got the same ring. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like, I, I get where you're coming from, but mm, no. Snots and boogers is better. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll but take snots and boogers no. over Arnie the Aardvark any day of the week. Yeah. If, if, he, if he shot out of his nose, I'd, I'd be wholeheartedly on board with snots and boogers. But uh, <laughs> it, just, it wasn't going to go there, I'm afraid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So speaking of surreal experiences, what was it like to see, you know, Kubert be turned into an animated, you know, Saturday morning cartoon? Wow. How was that for you? Yeah. Yeah. yeah weird. Uh, uh, you know, the whole... Kubert craze was just it took me by surprise i mean i was i was floored and i was i was thrilled but uh yeah i mean it was it was a little surreal of course you know we laughed about it at the office because you know we just thought it was ridiculous the whole you know Kubert in a letterman jacket and you know he's in high school and he's he's got arms like what, what you know so it's, we it was not i mean we had no input whatsoever yeah uh but, you know, I mean, I think, you know, we could have come up with something a lot better uh, if it was just left to us. But, uh, you know, maybe not arable. Maybe not arable on, on <laughs> you know. Well, with, sure. with the success, though, of you, know, you did have an animated series. There were plush toys. There were all kinds of toys. It was in movies recently, you know, obviously years later. But back then, did that help you in your career with the company? That, like, elevate you to, like, wow, he first game he comes in with, and it's a, it's a hit. He's the golden yeah. goose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have to say it did. Uh, the the nice thing about it was it, it was our best selling game. It was Gottlieb's best selling game ever. Uh, the only thing that I think even came close to it was Mach Three, the Laserdisc game. Uh, I love that game. And, and um, you know, I, I yeah, it just it, it basically gave me carte blanche to explore whatever ideas I wanted to explore, and I I. I guess I earned uh, a reputation for being reliable, you know. Um, but, you know, that, that only gets you so far. And, uh, you know, Gottlieb kind of got into trouble because that, that philosophy of letting the programmers just sort of do whatever they wanted, um, as the company grew and as the video department grew, it did not result in the number of hit games that they were hoping it would. Oh, and, too much freedom. Uh, yeah, exactly. And so then, you know, things kind of started to change and they got a little more, uh, you know, uh, management had to oversee more what was going on. And, you know, the environment changed. But even through that, I I, I kind of was left alone. I mean, I kind of was, you know, I wasn't I wasn't uh, I mean, I was I was subject to new rules. But I, I, I think, again, they they knew they knew that I was reliable. So. Yeah, but it did. It it certainly was a great calling card as I went ahead in my career. Yeah, who who wins oh, in a fight, Pac Man or Cubert? Who wins? <laughs> well, I mean, it's obvious. Cubert, can you can you see this thing behind me? No. Yeah, I was about picture. to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's a, a a drawing that was made by Rich Tracy, who was our art director at Gottlieb back in the day, and and after Cubert's success, he 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 gave me that as a gift. It's uh. Yeah, it's Cubert stomping on Pac-Man. <laughs> I wonder if Nintendo borrowed that stomping style from Mario and Super Mario Brothers. Because obviously Cubert was stomping on people's first, or people stomping at his head first before Mario was doing it. So Cubert yeah. was was an innovator. Well, all of video game design is somewhat synergistic. You know, uh, people will draw on everything that came before uh, and, and pull things from it. And, um, and that's just sort of natural. It's natural to... 
uh, any kind of creative arts, music or movies, you'll, you'll see that all the time. Yeah, everyone does copy me. <laughs> I got the age going here. People copy. It's, it's okay. It's all right. Shiloh, but another another question in they're the inspired. Chat. There you go. Shiloh, we had a question in the chat specifically um, regarding the quantity of the Warren Davis cabinet edition. Is there going to be a limited quantity on that? Oh, yeah. Yes, big time. It, they'll be numbered, and uh, we haven't set the quantity. Um, we want to make sure everybody who wants to pre-order one gets in and saves a little bit of cash and gets one. And then we'll have a certain amount after, during launch, um, for people that miss the pre-sale event. So I, I don't know how many it's going to be. Uh, we don't know because um, we, again, we want to get through this, this pre-sale period and, and see how many we pre-sell. Then we'll announce the number after that. So, uh, so at least you'll make sure people who want to pre-order it can get in on that pre-order. So you'll make sure you have at least that many and then maybe it'll a little on the top after that. Yeah, well, we'll cap it at a certain spot, um, point, you know, if we have to. Um, but I, you know, we again don't want to fuel the eBay um, crowd too much with their crazy high prices. And we want to make sure that people that are building uh, replicate, uh, you know, arcades in their homes can add whatever they want, not having to pay through crazy prices that, you know, uh, our, our cabs are going for now. On the on the secondary market, are you surprised about that? About how they've really shot up in value? No, um, because they're we think they're pieces of art, and um, we try not to uh, we try to keep it limited enough that you know there's enough out there for everybody, but at the same time, it's just not flooding the market, and in turn, us having to like mark products down and blow them out and stuff like that so i'm not that's i mean it was always kind of the goal is that you know you buy this it, our products aren't cheap but you know they're going to retain their value and they're actually going to grow in value yeah which is what you should absolutely hope for anytime you invest in a collectible i mean you don't want to pay yeah. you know a price for something and immediately like the you know brand new car where you drive it off the lot and it loses its value in thousands of dollars you don't want your new Qbert cabinet to be worth fifty dollars the moment you unbox it. I mean, the fact that potentially, if God forbid you needed to, you know, scrape some cash, you know, potentially you could make a hundred dollars back. So, I mean, that's that's a good problem to have. That just goes to show the demand for the product and the quality of the product. So, everyone out there, Charlotte just said, don't buy Bitcoin. Take all your money and invest <laughs> right now in New Wave Toys products. Yeah. Yes, that take financial <laughs> advice and do not buy Bitcoin. Yes, just buy our stuff. Thank you, Glenn. You're welcome. <laughs> but if people are on the fence, Shiloh, how long do they have until the pre-order window closes? Well, we're actually trying to run it for three weeks. Um, so we just started yesterday, so there's time. Um, we, we did something different with the game announcement um, this time around. And I think it's confused a lot of people because we've never done anything <laughs> like this before. And in fact, it's not a very common practice that anybody really does this type of marketing. But um, we took the original arcade flyer, shrunk it down, um, printed it on some high quality cardstock, um, got a nice um, cover for it, cardboard covered. A special Qbert envelope, and we have been mailing out thousands and thousands and thousands of these to our awesome customers all over the world. And um, it's an experiment in some ways, and uh, a lot of people are really excited to get it. And uh, so we, so far, it's it's been a, a good positive marketing experiment. That's what's really cool about Shallow and New Wave Toys. You, you even on your products when you get them, you put all these little extras in there you know sometimes i wonder how you do it but at the price point but we appreciate that i mean when i got it in the mail i was like what i'm like oh, oh i know what this means so it, it was really cool um they did that but really quick i want to get this in here if i can with uh, warren warren we wanted you to ask us uh, uh, or ask the audience if you can a trivia question that we can do this giveaway for so if you thought about something that you can put out there for one of our people to maybe get right and win something from the show um so do you want do you want something that i've said already or do you want something that i haven't said 
Hmm. Doug, what do you think? Dealer's, dealer's choice. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Wow. This is, boy, you guys put me on the spot. Um, Something you said, Warren. Just, all right. Just well, I'll go back to what I said earlier, which is, what is the hidden secret about the original Cubert that very few people know about the tuning of it? Oh, there we go. Oh, that is a good one. And we also still need to address the other phrase that Kubert says. Yeah, I, I, I may have missed it in the chat. We've been talking so much. I have to pay attention. But before the show ends, we will give the answer. So I already, personally, I remember him saying, bye bye. I still don't want to remember. Maybe it was insert coin. I don't know. I'm, I know Berserk did that. Give me, give me your money. Looks like we got a winner with uh, user Rogue Lyrics on YouTube talking about the level five. Level five is alive. <laughs> what, what about level five, though? That's uh, true. Yeah, that's half the answer. You'll you'll have to go and all right. We got a couple people regurgitating level five. Brad O'Connell says level five is as hard as it gets, which is that's that is a complete answer. the complete answer. Yep. So, Rogue, you were close. Brad got it though because he had the complete answer. So it's one of those Jeopardy s things. You got to you got to phrase the answer correctly. That is like, true. Brad O'Connell is the winner of our Retro Mania wrestling Man, game Brad, code giveaway. Brad brings the Brad game. You know, he, he's getting Brad. answers today. Yeah. So, Brad, reach out to myself, Stephen, or Glenn in a DM, and we'll get you set up with that code. I won't, uh, I won't borrow the code if I have it, so don't worry. It'll work. Let's Maybe. talk about... Let's talk about that last uh, phrase. So the phrase That's is, cool. are you ready now? Are you ready for this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Let's well, hear the phrases. I give one hint, though. It's in our, in our Qbert pre-sale video we made. It's the very first thing we hear. Yeah. Oh, hey. It's, hello, I'm turned on. And that happens <laughs> when you power on the machine. That's, That's probably perfect. why I never heard it, because it was always on in the arcades when I went. Yep. Never got that initial boot up experience, for sure. There you go. Now uh, I will. Yeah. And uh, bye bye, I believe, is said after you enter your initials in the high score table. Right. Was there was there what another a... phrase too? Or was it just those two? No, that's it. Yeah. Oh, what nice. a gentleman okay. Kubert is with his cordial <laughs> greetings and you know goodbyes. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate you guys programming the manners for the little guy. Well, yeah, and and you know, and the the sexual uh, you know in, innuendo. In, of, Hello, I'm turned on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. You know what, I I didn't even think of that. How did I miss that? How did I? <laughs> yeah, of all people, Glenn. Wow. Yeah. I'm too starstruck. That's what it is. <laughs> I don't know. Over here. I don't know if anybody's interested. Does do, do you want to get a look at at my machine? It's it's. Uh, I yes, think I can absolutely. see my camera yeah. here. If this is going to be a little weird. Cool. So bear with me. Uh, going on a ride. Going on a ride here. Well, there it is. It's kind of sideways. Oh, this is. Let's see. Can you see it this way? Ah, oh, damn! I, 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 I can't quite. I can't quite get to it. So close. I'm not even uh, drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Buckle your seatbelts, ladies and gentlemen. This is so weird. All right, there we go. There we go. Close. You can sort there of see go. it there. Oh, yeah, I see a Terminator Two next to it. Yes, yeah. I got a Terminator 2 right next to it. Those are the only two games that I actually have. Sorry, it's behind my monitor, so it's very hard to get good. the camera back there. But yeah. anyway. Got a nice shot of the marquee there. That is Unique it. Side side panel art. Yeah. Have you had any issues with your machine? You had to fix anything? Or has it been working like a horse uh, ever since? It's it's actually been working really well. I, I Occasionally, some of the, uh, the soundboard gets flaky. But uh, not not lately. It's actually been working. But um, yeah, I, I, there there have been times where the soundboard's been a little on the flaky side and might cut out. But uh, generally, it's been working. Uh, monitor still works. Everything everything still works. Yeah. I, I, there is a short uh, when you when you um, on the operator mode switch. So I actually had to use some alligator clip. I need to replace a switch. So uh, it's it's. Uh, it works, but uh, I have to use uh, alligator clips to <laughs> go into and out of operator mode. So that that's a little. But it's, I just need to. I'm just too lazy to go and fix it. <laughs> it sounds like your your typical arcade owner experience. You know, it works, but you got to jiggle this and you got to touch this yeah. together and yeah. you got to put the bubble gum here. I mean, that's the joy of owning a full size arcade machine. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, and I, I think, think I didn't mention this, but the the uh, swearing marquee was not the original marquee of this game. I I put the swearing marquee in uh, when I when I brought it home. It came with a regular Cubert uh, marquee, uh, and I I like the swear. I had a swearing one. And I thought, <laughs> oh, this is just so unusual since they didn't go out. I, I my memory is that they literally were only like twelve of the swearing marquees made um, ever. So. I don't know if that's correct, but that's my my memory. So I, I you know, mm -hmm. some historian. Who knows how many of there. those survived? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you see a lot of them, but they've been reproduced. So I, I would imagine that most of the ones you see are not original. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how you would tell an original from a, a replica. And it looks like you've got the uh, one of the prototype samples there behind you on the shelf. I do. I'm, I'm assuming everything you know. Give you got the you know stamp of approval. Because obviously you're you're the, the well, person that would know that machine more than anybody. It it is it's a first prototype, and and mm -hmm. I've I've actually sent a lot of feedback uh, to Shiloh and the guys uh, of of things that you know are are just slightly off or can be improved, and they're working on it. So uh, I have that. every faith that the final version will be uh, you know even more accurate than this is, and this one's pretty accurate. <laughs> you can't can't any better stamp of approval than the guy who made the game. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly yeah oh it's, it was surreal to bring it home and actually just hold it up right next to my actual cabinet it's it's very it's just uh it's it's mind-blowing yeah I, I know we need to start wrapping up the show but i do have one more question that you brought that up when you worked on this in 82 obviously electronics was a lot different everything was a lot bigger did you ever think back then you would have something that you could shrink down to make something like this back then did you ever foresee anything like that no, no, <laughs> never. I mean, it's like, why? <laughs> you know, this was disposable entertainment. It was being made as something to, you know, entertain. And we just thought six months from now, it's on to the next thing. So the fact that any of these games have withstood the test of time is just mind blowing in, in every respect. <laughs> well, awesome. Doug. Doug and I and Stephen are very honored you guys both came on the show today. And I know we're going to start wrapping up the show and hand it over to Stephen. But I would like to have you guys on again, you know, especially when we're getting closer maybe to, you know, the actual release of uh, Qbert, if you guys are game. Love to. Yeah, sure. You mm -hmm. bet. Love Absolutely. To. So now that we are in a more, um, less constrictive society right now and people are able to travel and go, you guys got any shows in the future to where you guys are going to maybe do some trade shows and, you know, talk about Qbert in the future. Warren, uh, I believe you got a book coming out or you're working on. Am I, am I yeah. yeah. Um, I, I had, uh, I had written a memoir and self published uh, right before the pandemic. Uh, but during the pandemic, when I couldn't travel or take it to shows, I, I found a publisher. Uh, and uh, so it's being, you know, rejiggered and uh, it's coming out this fall. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, it'll be uh, published by Santa Monica Press and uh, it'll be available everywhere. Uh, and then I'm hoping to do uh, uh, appearances uh, with the book to uh, show it off. And uh, yeah, actually, that's that's not the latest cover. Can you, if you scroll on that page you're showing it. There you go. That's the final cover. So uh, anyway, but uh, and and I'll I'll be going I'll, I'll be going to at least one uh, retro gaming show this year, possibly more. Uh, sort of in negotiations right now, but I will be going to the Korg's Con in Columbus, Ohio, in October of this year. I'm very excited. I've never been to this show, uh, but I used to live in Columbus, Ohio, and I have a fondness for the town. So. If you're in Ohio, uh, please come by uh, October 23rd. Nice. Awesome. Nice. Awesome. awesome. Did we lose Shiloh? No, no Shiloh's just in shock. He's just stunned. He's yeah. stunned. <laughs> Actually, he's, he, is, he is there. He's just maybe the connection dropped I told on you, his end, shocked. but he is there. Yeah. I'll see. You. I'll I hope see I, can I can bring. Uh, I, I I mean, Shiloh can't say no right now. So yeah, there you go. You can speak for can, him, and anything goes. <laughs> I hope I can bring a couple of units down and uh, and maybe uh, you know sell them. I will also say, if anybody ever comes up to me with with one of these units, I'd be happy to sign them uh, for them. 
That's awesome. There you go. Yeah. What what better collectible to have than a Warren Davis New Wave Toys Cubert machine signed by the man himself? I mean, it doesn't really get any more collectible than that. See, so, yeah, since it's although you know it, it would make it inauthentic since mine is not signed by me. The, I mean, oh. my machine at home is <laughs> not signed by. <laughs> I can I can understand that might feel a little you know self conscious autographing your own machine. <laughs> it took me a while. I mean, I have to say, uh, it, it took me a while to get used to the whole idea of autographing things. People do seem to like having things autographed, and I'm happy to do it. But you know, at the very beginning, uh, my thought was, why? Why would you? You know, my <laughs> autograph is worth literally nothing. So uh, you know, why? In fact. You know, I we didn't talk about this, but I, I've also done some acting. And, and uh, when I was starting out as an actor, people would, uh, after a show would ask me to sign their program. And what I would sign is, this will never be worth anything, Warren Davis. <laughs> <laughs> it, or just, you're very humble, which is, which is kind of cool. But, you know, these type of things, like for me and a lot of other people in the, in the community, this was our childhood. This was our our sporting event this was our superman type of thing so to us it's priceless so i want to thank you once again for creating something that was really fun back in the day and still is thank thank you for being a fan i'm it it uh, genuinely means a lot to me uh, it's a uh, it's a gift to to have something that people appreciate and uh and really means means a lot so thank you i think maybe the earthquakes got to shiloh cuz he had uh -oh. he froze and then <laughs> dropped and I don't see him back, but guys, um, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. I kind of stayed in the background and listened to the great information here that was being delivered. But make sure you, if you want to do the pre-order, head over to NewWaveToys.com. $129.99 for the Cubert X Replicade or $149.99 for the Warren Davis Edition. And as Shiloh stated, it will be limited quantities, and that's going to go until the end of the month. Uh, Glenn, why don't you go and tell everybody what you're working on? Because it's you have the long laundry list. Yeah, I, I do. Well, I, I will say that you know the uh, we have our steering wheel, which will be compatible with the version two and USB spinner, uh, coming to market very shortly. We have the boxes all done and sending them out. The version three trackball also is complete, being boxed up, and we're getting them out. We're having the same problems that everyone else is having, though. Is now, we're even smaller than New Wave Toys, so uh, I, can't even get, I can't even get one of those Japanese Beatles to carry a couple over. Um, <laughs> we, work has been progressing on the Akiri Warriors uh, joystick. You know, that's coming out. We're putting some enhancements on it, so it'll be easier to use and have some extra features that even the real joystick didn't have. Um, I have a few people join the team. I have uh, Gary uh, as well as Steven uh, who joined the team uh, helping us design some things. Um, that's pretty much it, really, that I could talk about. But stay tuned. We're, we're trying to get the Star Wars yoke that's out of stock. We're trying to get them over. But, again, maybe I can pick it back off Shiloh. If he gets a lot of space, I can put a couple of yokes on it as his transport. <laughs> but uh, I'm just really excited about this q -Bird. You know what the hard part is? Waiting now. You know, when you, yep. when you order these things, it's worth the wait. It really is. Mm -hmm. uh, but you got to wait, and it's tough. Yep. There's a lot of guys in the chat room, Kongs are us, saying that you might have to buy this now after watching the show. So, Mr. Disappointed. Mr. Yeah. Doug, how many did you pre-order before we uh, wrap out? Two. He did do two. <laughs> so that means, <laughs> Glenn, have, you, you must have yeah. to do four. Gotta have one of each. Gotta have one of each. Glenn, did you do four of each? Five of each? No, I've only, I have also only did the two right now. Only, only because... <laughs> I right my, now. No, well, I had, well, I had to because I literally, literally just had my roof done. My roof was like caving in so i lit the guy literally finished <laughs> yesterday with my roof so that was a little chunk of change that went down there so well but they know i'll get more well guys make sure you check out doug since he won't promote himself youtube.com slash cool toy and again we want to thank uh warren davis for joining us you guys make sure to check out his website warren davis shop dot square dot site you guys can see it right there in the lower third he's got a great blog and you guys can check out his book and uh I, I believe you did say you could still pre-order that, right? You can still get that? Uh, it is orderable on uh, on Amazon and okay. maybe even Barnes & Noble, but it won't be released until this fall. Okay, so there you guys go. Make sure you check it out on your favorite uh, book site, Amazon. I'll probably go over there and check it out. 
Guys, we really appreciate you tuning in. Really appreciate the uh, great feedback that you had here. Wait, wait. Let's see if we can get Shiloh back. See, this is why I, I produce and do this at the same time. We're going to get Shiloh back because I want him to be able to sign off if he has anything yeah, left to absolutely. say. So give me, bear with us, guys, that are in the chat here. Running double duty here. Shiloh, are you back? I'm back. All right, we're just about <laughs> to, to say goodbye to everybody. So plug away. I'll pull up your website and, uh, again, with, uh, with the orders. Yes, order, 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 order now. <laughs> Don't delay. <laughs> we need money. <laughs> That's probably the best, best sales pitch I've heard yet on the show. Absolutely, for sure. Thank you. <laughs> no, in, in, in all seriousness, take advantage of the pricing. Uh, make sure, here's a hint, make sure you sign up for um, our insider VIP uh, newsletter because you will get a discount code and you'll save a little bit more money even on top of what the uh, pre-sale price is already. We're trying to look after everybody who's looked after us over the last uh, almost four years coming on. So thank you, everybody. Oh, we have the best community. Um, we learn from them and, um, you know, we, we couldn't ask for, for a better uh, community uh, behind our products and uh, we're really grateful for that. So thank you, everybody. Everyone as well, you know, if you want, you're on Facebook, there is a New Wave Toys fan page. Please make sure you go on to Facebook if you're on there, search for New Wave Toys fan page and join. I'd love to have you. And again, Shiloh, it was great for you to jump in here and uh, get on here and, and come back even after it dropping off there. It was great to have you uh, pop back in. Yeah. Sorry, but I guess I have a problem with my electrical outlet that I'm not very excited about. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, these, these, these things happen. But guys that are watching, we really appreciate you tuning in. We'll be back. We'll definitely have these guys back on in the future, maybe closer to launch. And who knows? Maybe there'll be some other mini cades to come out that they can uh, talk about but guys really well, appreciate it we we'll do see. have more coming so we'd love to come back thanks for having us absolutely yes great to be here thank you guys well, till next time guys keep it buzzing <laughs>